Good evening. Um, I will call the January 9th meeting of the Town Council Committee of the Hall whole to order. All councilors are present. Calendar and communications. Excuse me? Calendar and communications. Councilor Morosic, do you have anything for us? Nothing to report. Nothing to report. Nothing to report. Uh, the only thing I have to report is last week I had um, councilors Rich Moravsik and Rita Schmidt and I have, were on the personnel committee and we went through the ad hoc, miscellaneous and ad hoc committee appointments and the reason I didn't report out on the minutes for that was because I needed to talk to people to make sure they wanted to do things. So that's been completed and I emailed the um, minutes of that uh, to the town manager and to Betsy. Thank you. <laughs> no meetings, no reports. No report. We were snowed out. Councilor Schmidt, any communications? Uh, no, there was a meeting of the executive board of the Eastern Connecticut Tourism District, and uh, we will be moving the offices from Bailey Agency over to Sector. And Councillor Zapari, any communications? Uh, yes, I, I did receive communication before from uh, one of our citizens living in Mystic about the uh, uh, Chapter 1 noise. He had earlier reported that the noise had abated after John Burt had uh, chatted with folks at Chapter One, but then sent an email out last week saying that the weekend before was just as bad or worse than it's ever been. So we still have that as an existing problem. Okay, um, there are several events that our town councilors will be attending in town, some ribbon cuttings and some meetings. So. Those, that will be happening this week as well. Town manager, is there anything you wanted to report at this point? I was going to mention on the chapter one that uh, planning and development services sent people there two different nights just to kind of go and sit in and, and on the weekends and see what was happening and they didn't run into extraordinarily loud music when they went. Um, and we've been talking about zoning options for what we can do. It's not looking likely that there'll be a zoning option. It looks like uh, noise ordinance might be the only thing other than uh, Chief Fusaro has an idea. You know how I mentioned that he's reconstituting a, uh, uh, what do you want, a community policing type thing? Well, he's going to have someone over there in that area and is thinking that person will regularly go in and check in and check the noise and check with them. So maybe we give that a while once he gets that constituted to see how that works out. So, but we're, we're monitoring it. <laughs> we're doing everything we can. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is item four, approval of minutes. I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the minutes of December 12, 2017. So, so moved. Second. Uh, moved by Heed, seconded by Morosik. Any discussion on approval of those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining. So passed unanimously. There is no unfinished business at this point, so we're moving to item six, new business. And the first item on the agenda is 2017-0297, Odd Fellows Home of Connecticut Incorporated. And I believe we have um, from our town attorney's office, um, Attorney Callahan, we have Assessor Mary Gardner, and we have Finance Director Cindy Landry with us, as well as the town manager. Thank you for coming out tonight to talk to us about this. And if everybody has their, um, if you have any questions, uh, we can ask the staff and the attorney to do a brief presentation and then we can ask questions at the end of their presentation if that's agreeable to everyone. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I, I prepared a, uh, a general history as to what transpired with the Oddfellows tax appeal. And um, I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Do you want me to uh, just jump right into it? Okay. Um, Oddfellows Home of Connecticut, Inc. Uh, does business as Fairview, and it owns real and personal property in Groton. There's a skilled nursing facility located on the property, as well as assisted and independent living units that they, they um, operate at the property. 
Uh, Odd Fellows was created by the Connecticut General Assembly in 1893. And uh, at the time, the General Assembly enacted a, what I'll call a legislative exemption in favor of, of Odd Fellows. And uh, the, I'll, I'll read it. It says, the estate, property, and fund which may be held by said corporation, Odd Fellows, for the uses and purposes here and before expressed shall, with the rents, income, and profits thereof, be exempted from all taxation, provided that the real and personal estate held at any one time by said corporation shall not am amount to more than $100,000 in value. And through the years, the monetary threshold within the legislative exemption was increased. Uh, $300,000 in 1925, 700000 in 1943, $1.5 million in 1953, $6 million, 73, $10 million, 82, and $25 million in 2012. Um, in addition to the legislative exemption, uh, around the year 2000, our legislature created a statutory tax exemption in favor of all skilled nursing facilities in the state of Connecticut, uh, assuming their license as such. And uh, Odd Fellows claims exemption under both this legislative and the statutory exemption. Um, and as of the 2015 brand list, uh, the town valued the uh, real and personal property of Odd Fellows in excess of $25 million. And the interpretation of the legislative exemption was that it was an all or nothing exemption. Uh, meaning that the amounts from $1 and above could be taxed uh, unless they otherwise benefit, benefited from Could the, you speak just a little louder, please? Oh, sorry. I'll move this closer. <laughs> The, um, in 2015, the value exceeded $25 million, and it was the interpretation of the exemption that it was an all or nothing exemption, meaning that if the $25 million threshold was exceeded, the town could tax from $1 and above, rather than just the amount that exceeded $25 million, uh, unless the Odd Fellows benefited from some other exemption, which would have been the skilled nursing facility exemption. So as a result, in 2015, the, uh, the entire property of Odd Fellows, real and personal, was taxed with the exception of the value of the skilled nursing facility component of their, their campus, is what I'll call it. Do you have a reference that speaks to that? Speaks to Do what? we have something that says that if it's above a certain amount, it changes? Well, there's, there, there's a legislative exemption that was created in 1893, and it had not been... Um, interpreted because the first time Odd Fellows had ever been taxed was in 2015. So it's never been interpreted by a court. So that was the, the, the our interpretation of what the exemption stood for. And of course, Odd Fellows had the opposite interpretation of what the exemption stood for. Do we, okay, so do we want to ask questions as Attorney Callahan is going to clarify? Is that what uh, you're I can wait. Well, uh, okay. Councillor Heed also had a question. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, normally, when you have a tax exempt property, there's a reason why it's tax exempt. So, when you consider that this was done by legislative action, it's a special act. Uh, how is it different than how, say, a church or um, a group home or something like that might not be taxed? Um, there was very little legislative history uh, surrounding this specific exemption, and that was one of the difficulties we had with this particular exemption. Um, usually the, the legislature, when they create an exemption, there's, there is some legislative history that explains what the purpose of it is. We didn't really have the benefit of that in this scenario, so we, we interpreted it to the best of our ability. And, um, you know, the town took the position it could tax, and Odd Fellows took the contrary position, which is really what what ultimately resulted in the tax appeal suit. I think Ms. Gardner wanted to speak as well. Things like churches, <clears throat> there are statutes that exempt them. It's very clear. And they have to file for it every four years as a quadrennial tax exempt return that's filled out in every assessor's office. This year is the year that they have to be filed in fact. So all the nonprofits, 501c3, those are all regulated by statute. 
And I believe this has a statute that, that, that was passed by the legislators that any, any kind of a nursing care facility, a nonprofit, falls into a different category? Uh, yes, I believe there's a general nonprofit exemption that they have to qualify for under 1281.7, which in this particular tax appeal, they were not claiming they were exempt under that particular statute. But, but they are. There is a, there is a statute, 1281.75. If you are a 501c3 skilled nursing facility, on, in 1999, there was a statute passed in 2000 that said any skilled nursing facility that already was qualified as a 501c3 from this point forward will be exempt. Which is why if you look over this paperwork, we um, didn't tax the skilled nursing facility. We excluded that portion of the value. So there are, just, just to clarify, and correct me if I'm, if I'm not right, Odd Fellows claims exemptions under two different categories. One is the legislative exemption, and then the other is what Councilor Ober was referencing, the skilled nursing facilities exemption. The skilled nursing facility is the one that's at about approximately $7 million at this point, and then the legislative exemption is a whole separate thing. So that it becomes important that you understand that as we're going through further, because it makes a difference um, as to the two, the two pots of money that are being taxed. Um, so, uh, in 2015, Odd Fellows paid approximately $260,000 under protest, and they filed a tax appeal with the Superior Court. Um, Odd Fellows took the position that it's not an all or nothing legislative exemption. We could only, their position is we could only tax the amount that exceeded $25 million. Um, that the term value within the legislative exemption meant assessed value or 70% value rather than fair market value, and that we couldn't include, could not include the value of their skilled nursing facility in determining whether they exceeded that $25 million value. Um, so prior, uh, I'm sorry, after they filed their, their tax appeal, they asked to meet with uh, representatives of the town, inc including myself, and during this meeting, they offered a preliminary um, proposal to um, try to resolve the lawsuit that they, they had just file, uh, filed. This was in June of 2016. They um, recognized that they do use some police and fire services within the town and hadn't really um, paid for those services through taxes like most taxpayers do. So they proposed a pilot to settle the lawsuit. Um, that initial pilot was $100,000 that they proposed to pay in two installments of $50,000 each, and um, then they would pay a total of $70,000 a year going forward. Um, we met with the council, uh, I met with the council along with uh, uh, Groton staff persons uh, on June, July 26, 2016, and um, that was an executive session, and following that meeting, I advised Oddfellow's attorney that the uh, town sought a, le a legal adjudication of the issues in dispute and that the proposal was not accepted at that time. So from that point forward, um, we began litigating the case in court, uh, filing discovery requests. Uh, we filed an answer uh, rejecting their claim. And our first pretrial in the case was in, it, it was in New Britain where most tax appeals end up. And on uh, February 14th, 2017, we had a pretrial with Judge Levine in New Britain. Um, all that really happened in that, at that pretrial was that we couldn't resolve the case. Uh, we had outstanding discovery issues that we wanted a, a hearing on. And it became, a, uh, to our, it came to our attention just prior to that pretrial that there was a special bill being proposed at the legislative uh, level to try to clarify this special act or this uh, legislative exemption. Um, the the clarifi clarifying uh, bill was called SB 377. 
And uh, the initial draft of that bill proposed to increase the monetary threshold from $25 million to $35 million and make it retroactive to 2012. Um, and it also sought to clarify that only the amounts exceeding that dollar threshold would be taxable. Um, on February 15, 2017, uh, the tax assessor, uh, Mary Gardner, and myself, along with the assistant tax assessor, went to uh, Hartford to object to this SB 377. I read into the record a joint letter signed by the Groton Town Manager and uh, Mayor Flax uh, voicing the town's objection to the proposed bill. And uh, Ms. Gardner wrote, uh, read, uh, presented a very comprehensive report to the, um, the Planning and Development Committee at the legislature and uh, provided information as to how this bill impacted the town financially and some additional background on the Odd Fellows um, property. Uh, our position was that this special, uh, this SB 377 should not take the matter out of the court's hands, that we wanted a legal adjudication and that this bill would really take it out of the court's hands and, um, and change the law. We, th we thought that should be decided by a court. Uh, Odd Fellows had a, a number of representatives at the Planning and Development Committee who testified in support of the bill, including um, Senator Summers. Um, it, it came to our attention after February 15th that the bill was passing through committee and it would eventually be presented to the, the Senate and House for a vote. Uh, on March 23rd, 2017, at the request of Odd Fellows, uh, we met with the Groton Town Council in executive session, uh, Senator Summers, representative, uh, representatives of Odd Fellows, and Representative De La Cruz all attended. Uh, there was no resolution to the lawsuit reached at this meeting. Um, following the meeting, <clears throat> I indicated to Odd Fellows' attorney that we wanted the bill dropped and uh, the response was that they were gonna continue seeking the clarification through the bill. Uh, we met again with the town council on April 19th, 2017, along with Odd Fellows. There was no resolution uh, reached at this meeting. We uh, met again, or I'm sorry, on April 24th, 2017, a uh, joint letter signed by the town council. I believe eight out of nine counselors signed it. I don't recall why the, the ninth counselor uh, was not on the letter, but um, it was a letter to the certain senators and representatives uh, reiterating the town's opposition to SB 377. And um, that was sent on April 25th, 2017. Um, April 26, 2017, Mayor Flack sent a letter to members of the legislature asking them to um, disregard the April 24th letter because uh, we were attempting to negotiate a pilot in good faith. On May 4th, 2017, the council met again with Odd Fellows in executive session. Um, no resolution was uh, reached at this meeting. Uh, met again on, eight, on May 8th, 2017, no settlement was reached at, the, at that meeting. Um, we, we were gonna take the matter up again on May 23rd um, on, or, on or about May 9th, uh, the council requested to meet on May 11th to broach the subject of settlement again. It was at this meeting that a settlement was reached and the uh, tentative framework of the settlement was that the council would support SB 377 and the, um, and the town would receive a pilot payment from Odd Fellows. It would be retroactive to 2015. It would be a 10-year pilot. The amounts above $25 million would be taxed. And um, in addition, the town would receive a pilot payment of about $60,000, of, of $60,000. Um, from that point forward, we, um, we started working on the actual language of the pilot agreement and um, Ultimately, the pilot agreement was signed on November 20th and accepted by the court. 
so now it's a court ordered stipulated judgment that's been accepted by the connecticut superior court and that's the general overview of kind of the case from start to finish entered by the court is that correct that's correct in other words it's a dead issue at this point well it's it's been accepted as court orders by mutual agreement of all parties yes there's no way even if we wanted to there's no way to go forward with this i don't i don't see a way to change that agreement councillor parker is a 10-year agreement is that what i'm getting out of it yes it includes the grand list year of october 1 2025 and then um there's a language in the agreement that there's a good faith commitment that the parties will attempt to negotiate another agreement after it expires but it's it's there's no guarantee a new agreement can be reached yes and the pilot money is paid each year at 60 000 or a different amount there will be two installments of 30 000 dollars a year because the the tax payments are paid in two installments a year and because there was a 260 000 over 260 000 taxes paid under protest those will be credited towards payments due until that money is used up could you say that again please that there was when the case started 260 000 was paid under protest so um because we we've reached this settlement a portion of that money is deemed an overpayment because with the taxes above 25 million plus the pilot payment they paid more than they were supposed to for 2015 so that money will be applied until it's depleted and then actual new money will will be paid to the town after that date councilor atwater did i miss something or what happened to sp 377 oh yeah good good question so yes sp 377 was passed by the legislature so the final version of that bill uh it takes out the 35 million dollar language and um essentially the the dollar threshold is 25 million dollars it makes clear that we can only tax the amount that exceeds 25 million dollars uh we cannot include the value of the skilled nursing facility in determining whether the 25 million dollar threshold has been reached it relates to value not assessed value and it applies from october 1 2017 and years going forward so if i understand then the pilot is a 10-year deal and and has no bearing on sp 377 or with 377 overrule the pilot and change the amount of money that's paid no the for the 10 years that the pilot is in effect the pilot controls how the relationship between odd fellows in the town works notwithstanding what sb 377 says conceivable then in 10 years if it's favorable to odd fellows not to renew the pilot because their tax is less there's no guarantee that it will continue for another 10 years that's correct there's there's a good faith commitment to try to negotiate a new agreement after 10 years but it's it's um, if one cannot be reached then the pilot essentially ends councilor heat i assume there's a well there's a facility with nursing skilled nursing in it and then the rest of it residential restaurant there's other property on that is part of this if you were to remove the uh, nursing facility, that's where we came up with the, the we being the town came up with two hundred and sixty thousand dollars in tax in twenty fifteen. Is that right? That's where that assessment came from. Yes. Yes. Okay. So right. in effect, by this agreement, we're giving them a two hundred thousand dollar tax break every single year. Uh, well, uh, just. I mean, Sorry, go ahead. to clarify my previous answer so the 260 paid under protest um, was not the full amount of the tax due 
so when a tax appeal is filed, you can pay a certain percentage of the tax due under protest. So I think the full amount of the tax that would have been due is, I think, just shy of $300,000. Yeah. Um, so this uh, pilot arrangement pays $60,000 in pilot money, plus the amount above $25 million will net about an additional 40000 So the net effect is about $100,000 a year. Um, so your, your analysis is correct, um, but also I think part of what um, was being weighed here is there's the risk that if we tried the case, we could end up with nothing. A court could disagree with our all or nothing interpretation, and then we don't have a pilot agreement, um, and we have essentially zero. Anything else? Councilor Zapari was next. I'm a little bit confused now. You said that according to the agreement, the $25 million exemption does not include the value of the nursing, the skilled nursing facility. Under the um, SB 377, that's the way the SB 377 is worded, but the agreement has a different way that the um, skilled nursing facility will be included in terms of value. So under the pilot agreement, we do include the value of the skilled nursing facility in determining whether the $25 million has been exceeded. Okay. So you, you say the pilot agreement. The pilot agreement is the, the agreement that was uh, uh, was entered as a judgment. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Council Morapsic was next. Yeah, Eric, I just want to make sure that all new construction in the future up there Oddfellow will be taxed in a court uh, above that 25 million. The only way it, it would not be is if it, it otherwise qualifies for an exemption. So as an example, if they build a wing to their skilled nursing facility, that's yeah. that's. Um, if it if it has to do with nursing or facilities, you're right. It, it goes under the under the exemption of the uh, the legislation exemption. But like if they build uh, another restaurant or more housing, that's taxed. That will be that will increase the twenty five million dollars and yes, the amount above can be taxed. Okay. Did you have another question? Uh, I don't know why we're doing this, so I guess my question is why is it back here? We have an agreement that we signed, correct? That that's correct. And yes. we can't change it for ten years, correct? That's correct. So I don't know what we're discussing. I mean, it's good to be educated as to what really happened, but it's in place. And I'm sure whatever they build in the future, they're anticipating the fact that they'll be paying taxes on it. Councilor Franco. So both the, the Grant Town Assessor and you both objected to SB 377. Correct. So Heather Summers, by proposing this actually put us in a bad situation with our negotiations? Uh, well, it, it, the, the act was essentially taking the matter out of the court's hands um, and clarifying the law. So um, in essence, it, it, it um, yes, it, it, took, it, it, it changed the, the playing field a little bit on, on how we approach the case. And go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so by asking them to increase it to $35 million, was there anything positive that would have been for the town by asking for it to move up to $35 million? Uh, from a tax perspective, no. Um, you know, I don't know about you know, the, the internal workings of Odd Fellows and, and the, the, the advantages that could have raised internally and, and then to the town as an effect. Okay. But we do have money coming from the state in lieu of not of some of the taxes that are not be, being paid that you feel should be paid. Uh, the, well, the, under the agreement that was accepted by the court, the money comes from our fellows, not the state. But isn't there a, they didn't call it a pilot, they called it something else. Where we get, Thank you, John. Yeah, in this budget calendar, for this budget year and the next budget year, there's a million dollars each year, and it's sort of lumped in under Balfour Beatty. It's not a pilot, it's kind of right. more Lewis services, but 
at Balfour Beatty military, they say that military housing, um, the, the uh, odd fellows and other open space that's not taxed. So it's sort of lumped in and $1 million uh, service is not pilot in lieu of for two years. It's guaranteed, it's only for two years. I do know Senator Summers is working on extending that longer. So we really did make up some of the loss. Would you agree? Um, I, I, I don't know uh, what, how, how that's tied to the taxation. Well, what's Mary think? Was it Mary thing? Yeah. <laughs> On just my question that I just asked, not the whole thing. I think this is a 10-year agreement, and that's a two-year pilot from the state, and, and a small portion of it goes to Oddfellows. I'm not even sure how much. Do you have a sense of how much? I don't think there's any breakdown on it. <clears throat> so the reason why um, we are doing this is because if you, if you would go through um, what the attorney has laid out for us, um, for quite a while, the town and the council were in agreement that this should be adjudicated in a court of law. And then all of a sudden, there was a, there was a change and we don't really understand why there was a change. And it seemed to some people that we were put in a very bad position um, when all of a sudden we went from opposing this piece of legislation to seemingly overnight supporting the legislation. And um, without, from what I understand, town staff does not know the reasons why um, the support was pulled, or the, the opposition was pulled and the support was thrown in favor of SB 377. And I think what um, my goal was, was to have all of us as new counselors understand actually what happened and understand the timeline. Um, and once we understood the timeline, then we could move forward with asking the why questions. So um, the way I see it is tonight is kind of a first step for us to understand actually what happened. And I think the attorney, and if you have questions for the finance director and the assessor, um, now would be a good time to ask them. But for us to understand this part of the um, issue, and then um, in the future, we can then ask the why questions of, of the appropriate people. Um, I don't know if anyone else has questions for. What would have been, over. if I may, I'm sorry. No, go. I guess I should, uh, what would be the tax if, if had you, if what your feeling was on this, that once it went over the 25, it was taxable, what would that have given to the town? 300,000 in taxes annually. So for the next couple of years, you, in essence, that's covered. I, I don't know if that's true. Ian. Well, let's say we're going to get 500000 for that, and then what they pay. Well, I think it would have been 300000 per year. So over 10 years, that's assuming the property value never changes. That would be $33 million, right? Uh, versus 100000 times 10, which is $1 million. So it's $2 million tax difference. Um, over 10 years. If we won, that's right. If you won, that's right. Can right. you say that again? It, the, you, a, big on, a big unknown right. was, are we gonna win the court case? And that was not, uh, that was not a given. So that, that all did play a part in exploring whether or not to settle. Councilor Overy had asked that you repeat your Math calculation. He's, the, he's a revenue manager. He can do this. <laughs> <laughs> if it was 300000 if you win the case, 300000 a year for 10 years, assuming the property value, the evaluation, nothing, nothing changes, that is $3 million. If you do 100000 per year for 10 years, nothing changes, it's $1 million. So the difference is $2 million. That would be taxable. That would not be collected in taxes. That would be revenue. <clears throat> revenue. Uh, anyone else? Did I miss anyone else asking for questions? I, Councilor Atwater. Um, just, it's, it's not directly related to this case, but when the legislature passed this back in what, 1893 or something, 
there must be other institutions in the state that, that fall under this. I mean, they, did they do this just for Odd Fellows of Broughton? Yes, this is specific to Odd Fellows. Um, and so their property no, is owned in Groton. So there's no other case, so to speak, you can look at in New Britain or, or Greenwich or whatever that would, would follow the same kind of, of situation? Um, no, I mean, this, this was a pretty unique act that was, Boy, I'll say. It, was <laughs> it, it was, the intent was to create Odd Fellows as a corporation and then to, uh, then there's a, a provision that gives them an exemption. And um, again, there wasn't much legislative history surrounding it. And um, it is unique just to Odd Fellows. Mm. Okay, thank you. I don't want anybody to misconstrue my questions because I do live up there. So I wanted to <laughs> tell you that that's the case, but I still want things to be explained and I'm glad that you are. I have been kind of part of it as it's been going along. Councilor Franco? So, 18, what was it, 1898? 93, I'm sorry. 1893. There were odd fellows. This was a group of people. They took care of orphans and widows, and they were sort of a group. And over time, they don't exist up there, do they? Well, they, um, the, the purpose from 1893 up until today has changed, and they've amended the legislative act to say that they can, I, I believe off the top of my head, it says something like they can provide any uh, services allowed by a non-stock corporation in Connecticut consistent with- mission changed. Yeah, consistent was, with 501c3. So okay. their uh, purpose has changed since 1893. Okay. Do you have more follow -up? Any other questions for the attorney or staff? Okay, thank you very much for coming out. Thank you for the research. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. your time. Matt is on his way in. Thank you. Okay. So that moves us down to um, 2018-0004, pending litigation. This is a standing referral. Uh, but we are waiting on the town attorney. Um, I believe we should hold off because the next item would be quite lengthy, correct, Mr. Mr. Burt? I know. Yeah. Okay. It's all part of um, uh, Mr. Schneider's presentation. Uh, Thomas Road, Virginia's Court, and illicit stormwater discharge ordinance are all together with Mr. Schneider. Okay. Um, do we want to address 2017 right now? You could 2017-0293, and you could tell us what you wanted to do with that, um, Councilor Heath. Adoption that of rules for the 31st Town Council. 0293. Yeah. Right. Actually, there were quite a few um, updates and adjustments to be made, so I'd like to refer it back to the subcommittee one more time. Okay. Second. Thank you. So 2017-0293. Um, uh, they would like that sent back to the subcommittee because of the um, um, questions that were raised by the town attorney um, as far as our rules. Nothing, nothing uh, illicit that we did, but just they're just doing a right down review. To spelling checks right. and grammatical errors. And Excellent. Um, I'm not sure if I'm seeing Mr. Oje. So how about 2017-0299, Liberty Bank Grant? Could we jump to that, Mr. Manager? The Senior Center Grant? Sorry to catch you off guard. I just thought we'd fill time while we were waiting. <laughs> 2017-0299, which is the Liberty Bank grant, which should be fairly straightforward, I, I assumed. Um, it's a request from Mary Jo Riley at the Senior Center to apply for a grant to do a personal finance program um, to be offered twice a year to the clients at the Senior Center. And we have two alternatives to approve the application for grant funds 
or to recommend that staff does not apply. So what we would be looking to do tonight was just to authorize um, the town manager to apply for the grant. Do you want to go ahead? I think it's an excellent opportunity to add something uh, that I think is very important. Um, so I would be totally in, uh, behind this. Councilman Rossick, would you like to read that resolution? I'm just trying to, are there any other comments? Uh, we need to read the resolution and then we can. There's a resolution. <laughs> it's on the back of the memorandum from um, the yeah, town no, manager. The resolution authorizing an agreement with the Liberty Bank to a grant for foundations and personal finance, complete guide to money, a financial wellness program. Whereas the Groton Senior Center would like to apply for a grant funds in the amount of $3,500 from Liberty Bank Foundation, and whereas the funds would be used to offer a financial peace, complete guide to money programs through the purchase of a turnkey curriculum that teaches students the value of saving, spending, and giving to guide to the path of financial literacy, and whereas the Groton Senior C Center and Liberty Bank encourage education for people to take control of their finances. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town manager or his designee is authorized to apply for the Liberty Bank Foundation grant in the amount of $3,500 to support the program of the Groton Senior Center. I so move. Second. So moved by Morovsic, seconded by Parker. Um, Councilor Zaperi, did you have discussion? I had a question that it appeared when I was reading this that the uh, grant would provide for 15 packets uh, of, of the printed material that students will need. And they're planning to run two sessions, um, uh, one in the summer and another the following winter. Is, uh, will 15 packets be sufficient to run two sessions? Uh? She, um, she addressed that in here. Um, It allows online access. So if you go to, it's not numbered, it's item number eight in the letter from um, Ms. Riley. The grant provides the funds to purchase the necessary materials, kits, and books that will be able to be used over and over. And the access that is allowed online will enable the coordinator to download all the necessary forms for the first class and future classes. So there are provisions um, to be able to reuse the materials and have online access to more materials. Well, it said here 15 uh, Financial Peace University packets. Um, does, uh, that doesn't mean, does that mean that each student or each person participating will not get a packet? Or does that mean we anticipate we're going to have fewer than 15 people in two sessions? No, I, be I believe what, what she stated here in item 8 is that because when they make the purchase, it will also allow online access. So once it's, it, if they use the consumables, then they will also be able to download more information from online. All right. Councilor Heath? Is this only available to seniors at the senior, senior center? I believe so. Not yet. Talk well if you. <laughs> Are there any other questions about this? No, I move to approve. Move to approve. And if there's no further discussion, we will vote on Item 2017-0299, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? So moved unanimously. And um, I don't see count, uh, Attorney Auger yet. So Mr. Burt, shall we move on with um, Mr. Schneider and his, his items? We could probably start with the Virginia's court project. Yes. Just, that's not quite as lengthy as like the Thomas Road project, if you wanted. Okay, so 2017-0094, and here's Mr. Schneider, our Public Works Director. Thank you for, We're gonna do for stepping Virginia's up and filling right in. Now. Oh, okay.
So if you would start us off with 2017-0094, for the Virginia Court project, please. Okay. Uh, this was a project that uh, was to look at the accidents. Well, starting back uh, when we were looking at the accidents throughout the town on local roads, or the intersection of local roads with state roads. We did an analysis with the police department of all the accidents uh, that we had, and this area came up with the highest rate of accidents that, that we had in, in the town, uh, and these were vehicle accidents. What we did is there was a grant program out there through the state DOT, through the COG, and we made, a, uh, we made an application, council approved the application, uh, to be made to the, uh, for this accident reduction program. And we were awarded a grant uh, to uh, do the design that would be on the town's dollar, and the state grant itself would pay for the, for the project. The project was to dead end the court, was to make it, make it a cul-de-sac still providing you an emergency access area. It would be a grass paver uh, area there, so if a police or fire vehicle, an emergency vehicle, could still use it to get into that area. And it would also be a walkway there. So the same walkway that we have there right now, or the, uh, the entrance uh, to that area for uh, people who are walking from the uh, shopping center uh, across the street would still be there. We uh, went and did all the design work. Uh, and then we went and had a public information meeting that was held at the, uh, at the senior center. Um, there were over 50 residents, and just to put it uh, really uh, bluntly, uh, all of them said no. They did not want that. It wasn't in the best interest of the neighborhood. Uh, don't know why that it even thought of, and, uh, and, and uh, they just felt it was just a, a total waste of state funds or anyone's funds. We brought that back to the town council. Town council at the time also had numerous uh, emails uh, uh, and, and other correspondence from the residents in the area. There was a petition signed too. I do believe there were several hundred people I had signed a petition that they did not want that court closed. The council at the time then asked me to take a look at several other items that could be done uh, in that area. And since this was a grant for local roads, not much could be used, if any, on a state road. But the state has done some stuff. They, they had refreshed the line striping in the area. The state has just completed a program throughout the whole town, in fact, throughout the whole area, of putting new signage up for crosswalks. And you can see them, those are those fluorescent orange uh, signs, that, uh, fluorescent orange, excuse me, the, and the lime green signs that they have through, throughout the area. Uh, and if there could be more lighting in the area, there is a street light on every pole in that area. So there really is nothing else that can be done. So for us to uh, close this out with the state, the state is requesting that a letter be sent uh, from the town of Groton uh, to just close out this, 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 this project with the state, and they'll use the money in some other location. There is no other place in the town of Groton that, that I feel that we can use this money that would meet the, uh, the accident levels uh, on local roads. Uh, we looked once, and we looked twice, there just isn't. So, what I am asking here uh, with, the, with the emails for the town council to authorize the manager to uh, sign uh, and, and a letter more stating that uh, uh, to stop the project, turn the funds back to the state. So it's a state road. Um, who, is, who would put up a stoplight if that was an option? Because I, I just drove down there tonight to come to, to this meeting. And you know, I make a left off of North Road, and then I go. There are three stoplights further down. Um, I believe they're all synced, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which is very nice for traffic flow. I think it's the only place in town where they are synced, other than right in front of Big Y. Um, but if it's a state road, would we put in a stoplight, or is that an option, or do it, they put in it's a not, stoplight? It, it, or excuse me, is it, that it, it's that would be the state of Connecticut. What the we did look at other options, and one is there's too many lights in that area probably right now. Second, uh, there's the traffic volumes that would warrant a light traffic signal in that area. So uh, it's uh, it just it, uh, the state wouldn't. We could ask the state. I don't think the state would uh, would come back favorably. So there's not enough traffic volume, but that's where we have the most accidents. Correct. Because most of the accidents were turning accidents. There are rear enders. Uh, there was a fatality there of a person crossing, not in the crosswalk, uh, it, uh, but that was a fatality. But this was, did not address, it would have addressed that in a way is taking those turning movements out of the area there because it is confusing when you go with school that's out 
know, or some other activities time there. It is confusing. People are dodging in and out of traffic, even with the, uh, uh, with the uh, stores that we have on the corner there. It makes it a little dicey. But it would be the state of Connecticut that would uh, determine if a traffic, traffic light would be warranted in that area. Councilor Morosik? Yeah, that uh, for Jenna's Court is no different than some of the streets down in Mystic and, and other areas of the town where you turn right into the state road. I, I think one of the main concerns that we had was public safety. Uh, closing that road would have uh, created a, uh, a problem for the fire trucks and, and ambulances and so forth to getting into there, into that particular area. They'd have to go through the, the other street, Central Street or so. So I, I think, you know, that's, that's one of the concerns that the, uh, the council had. And, and the other concern was the signage, which the town or the state said they would take care of. And, and, and I think, you know, leaving it open is, is the, in the best interest of the, the people in that area. And we just, they know that it's a dangerous area or it's no more dangerous than the one over there in Mystic by uh, the ancient Mariner, where people come in and out on, on, on Route 1. So I, 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 I'll make a motion to uh, have the town manager uh, sign a letter to the state or send a letter to the state uh, to close this project and, uh, and they can use the money wherever they need. Second. Second. So um, motion to authorize the manager to send the attached letter to the state uh, by Morosik, seconded by Obrey. Um, Councilor Zapari. I just, uh, you know, I didn't get a chance to ask a question before. Uh, just what have we paid for the studies that went into the development of the project that we're now withdrawing? There's one traffic study that was done in 2004 because the question was back in 2004 is that if we closed that court, could the other two entrances into that area, which is off of Debo Road, Fitch Avenue off of Debo Road, and Central Avenue onto Route 1 could handle the traffic flows. That report was, was done in 2004. I would have to find out the price. The engineering work that was done up front was done in-house with the town engineer and his staff. So th there was no out-of-pocket expenses. We, didn't, we did not hire any, any sort of a consultant. We just expended in-house uh, man so, hours. So it was the one traffic study that you did? Correct, about 2004. So it was just that. And, okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we have a resolution to authorize the town manager to send the letter. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, abstaining, that passed unanimously. And I'm gonna defer to the manager. Uh, Attorney OJ is here, so how do, you, how do you wish to proceed? Are we going back to the agenda? What's that? You're gonna go back to the agenda? I would think so, yeah. Okay, so do you now? Sure. Okay. I uh, hereby move that members of the Town Council Committee of the Whole, Town Manager John Burt, Tax Assessor Mary Gardner, Finance Director Cindy Landry, and the Town Attorney Matt Auger go into executive session pursuant to General Statute Section 1-2006B for the purpose of discussing strategy and negotiations related to pending litigation and or pending claims concerning lawsuits filed separately by Pfizer Incorporated and by Groton Long Point Association. I so move. Second. Second. Moved by Granitowski, seconded by Morosik. All those in favor of going into executive session say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. abstaining. Okay, we are in executive session. Okay, we are out of executive session and we have um, Public Works Director Mr. Schneider and Parks and Rec Director Mr. Barry with us. And we are working on 2017-0296 which is the Thomas Road Project update. Thank you for your patience. Okay, the, uh, it's getting late in the night, so uh, if, the, if the council will let me, I'll jump to the conclusion, and then we can ask questions uh, uh, if, there, if there's anything. So what it really boils down to is um, really two things. One, the price of this project is 2.2 to, to $2.6 million. We don't have the final estimate yet. We don't have the final design yet. We don't have all the properties. We're still going through, we're still going through all the permitting. Right now, the federal money is capped at $1.4 million plus $50,000 for, excuse me, $40,000 for land takes. So really what it comes down to is that does the town want to put in about $1.2 million of its own funds into a 3,400 
uh, foot bikeway, bike path along it. If the, the, we have existing funds that have been appropriated for this out of LOSEP and our capital improvement program project money of about $415,000. We've estimated from the department th that by resurfacing the road and adding four feet on to each side, we can get two 11-foot travel lanes in, which meets the DOT standards, and two four-foot bike lanes in that would be line stripe for bike lanes, which is to the standard for a bike lane in this area. So for roughly about $450,000, I can resurface the road. I can add two four-foot bike lanes, one on either side, in either direction, onto this. And, and the project's done. If not, if, the, if it's the council's wish to continue with the project, we'll go through the permitting. We'll go through the land takes. We still won't have all the easements that we need. We'll go through uh, all of the cost estimates, and uh, the way it's going is that I will be seeking then a supplement, not a supplemental appropriation, but another appropriation of funds to complete the project. This project's been going since 1990, when it was first thought of. The project's just uh, spiraled up. Some of the weird stuff on the project is, is that because we're using federal funds, there is a flood management ma uh, MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, that goes through several items. One of the items that they're going to make us do is because this, there is a bridge. This is a bridge over Birch Plain Creek. The, the DOT bridge people are actually uh, doing, the, uh, doing the review. Because of the flooding of this area, that this area could flood, the railings on this bridge, which is a boardwalk, have to come down when it floods. They are detachable. So when it's flooding out there, I'm supposed to send my crews out there to take the railings down. We're still on the golf course, golf course entrance or the golf course side of it. We're going through the FAA right now because of the height of the golf course fence netting. It's 30 feet. It's lower than any of the trees there. But since we're putting a new structure in there, they're going through a, a four-month review. It's two months in, 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 in the review process already. That may require us to put lights on top of those poles or lower the poles to 19 feet. The property owner wants 30 feet. We're also now having to do calculations because in this area, there's a chain link fence, and a chain link fence has a mass to it. There's a webbing. We ca floodwaters don't go through that. Now we're adding a golf course netting on top of that. We're running calculations to see how much floodwaters won't flow through that. It goes on and on with one thing after the other. On the Birch Plain Creek side is uh, because a structure can't be any higher or lower than the existing culvert, we have to now sink the bridge abutments into the soil there that we found to be contaminated. So now we have contaminated soil that we have to, it just goes one thing after the other. I was assigned this project after Mike Murphy, which was about four years ago, who's a planning director who, uh, who had retired, and we had done everything to move this thing forward. We've gone through two environmental reviews. We've gone through three historic structure reviews three of them in that time period, like an, like an historic structure was going to appear. This is a 10-foot wide asphalt path five feet off the road. So what the department is proposing to the council is doing, doing, doing the alternative. Let's take our existing money, um, pave the road, put two four-foot bike lanes in. It will be constricted at the bridge, at the, at the existing culvert. Uh, the second thing would be, as development occurs along Thomas Road, then require the abutting property owners to maybe build that path. We're not using federal money. If you stay out of the sensitive areas, it can be built fairly cheaply. It's an asphalt path. And the third thing, which is you never like to turn money back to anyone, is, but I need council and the manager's approval, is to go up to the COG, Council of Governments, and to the state and say, can these funds be used for another project in the town of Groton. What I do not know, and I didn't want to ask too many questions up there without, um, without some authorization, these funds are earmarked. I don't know if they're earmarked for the town of Groton for Thomas Road or earmarked, earmarked for the town of Groton for bikeway or bike path. I would have to find that out, but I didn't want to go uh, and start asking the state. So, so what we have here is, is a project that looks like if, if it does go through final design, if the council con uh, would, wishes it to continue on, there will be uh, more funds in the CIP that will be identified that we'll need for the project. Uh, it will not be constructed until roughly the end of 2019 uh, after all of the design. Uh, 
and that's uh, that's what we have. So uh, that in a nutshell. Thank you. I have several questions. Um, so the paving would not occur until when? Twenty after twenty nineteen. The paving would not. Uh, it's my recommendation to the council is that we do not resurface that road until after the construction of the bike path, because there will be a contractor out there digging and constructing the bridge. The bridge had the, the boardwalk over Birch Blank Creek is piles that are either driven or screwed into the ground. So he'll have heavy equipment out there scarring up the road. So my recommendation is that we just patch the road until that pro the project, the bikeway project is completed. So the road would not be resurfaced until about 2020. So as someone who uses that road multiple times every day, um, and speaking as someone who knows it's one of the major egresses out of the city of Groton, um, that road is horrible. Um, it's been neglected for way too long and something needs to be done with it. I am not so concerned about having a bikeway. I'm more concerned about having pedestrian access for people that actually walk on that road to get to and from um, Shenacosset Road over to the Big Y Plaza. So if we go ahead and we would say sanction your alternative, which would include the 11 foot travel lanes and the four foot shoulder on each side. My concern is that those four foot shoulders are kept clear even during the winter for people to, to walk there. When, uh, you know, there are people that bike in the winter as well, but my concern with getting a path in there, getting a sidewalk there, was not so much for the recreational person, but for the person who uses it to commute to and from their job um, to and from the grocery stores. So uh, can we be assured that that would be taken care of if we would go ahead with the two four foot shoulders? Absolutely, because it's a road that I plow or my crews plow. So it's just part of a, a wider road. We plow uh, Flanders Road, which is a wide road, a 40 foot wide road. We do have a bike path on South Pleasant Valley Road. There's a 10 foot dedicated asphalt bike path, bikeway. We plow that, so it's just another item that we'd plow. This would be part of the regular route. That would be clear of snow. It'd be clear of snow to the edge of pavement. So that, if we went ahead with a four-foot shoulder, even that would not happen until 2019. Nope. Uh, no, uh, I could schedule that paving in for next year. Thank you. Uh, this suggestion you was it still includes widening the bridge, though. No it, no, it does not, because that's where I get into permitting. Uh, what we would do, it, was, it would narrow down in that, that portion. Uh, it is, oh, I don't have it, the width in my hand. It's more than 22 feet wide, but not much more than that. So there would, would be a constriction there. What I haven't had time to take a look at is that uh, that coverage was put in there in 1985, so it's nearing its useful life. Can we replace it with something wider? If, when it does get replaced, it should be replaced with something wider. Can I cantilever something off the edge to get a, a walkable uh, path in? Uh, that would be something I, I, we could look at. We probably have the same, some of the environmental issues that we have, shadows in the water. If we do anything in the wetlands or tidal wetlands, we have some permitting there. Uh, but right now, it would not widen it at the bridge. Whatever the width is, will it's, uh, that's, that, that's what it would be. So there would be a construction there. Um, I noticed that there's an estimated balance of uh, $115,178.11. $178 Where did that come from? <laughs> Uh, as as it, that was on page two, as you can see, they're really account numbers. These were projects that were approved by the council and the RTM for expenditure, so that's what's remaining in the in a what the close up account, which is state money given to each town, local capital improvement, and then the CIP is our, our own capital improvement. So there is a balance there that's unencumbered. That's um, I hate to use the word free balance. It's, now the it's, free balance goes back to two thousand and one when you had uh, uh, what, you had twenty-five thousand dollars of uh, uh, left over from sixty thousand dollar appropriation. Correct, and that. Why, and why was that not returned to the general fund? It it was. It was either if it was general fund money, it was returned to the general fund. If it was low set money, it it just gets held in our low set account down in finance up at the state. So it it is not. It does not. When it's returned to the general fund, it does not. It 
the the mill rate is not offset by the presence of that money in the general fund. No, it, it's calculated into the fund balance. So if you have enough fund balance and you take from fund balance for for the mill rate, it was the money I have. In the capital improvement program, we have five years to expend all the funds. And so what it was, it was taking that long, it was just closed. We couldn't expend all the funds in that period of time. Well, this goes back to 2001, so we're talking right. about, what, uh, 17 years. Absolutely, and there's even even before then, uh, there were studies being done on this, on this project. But you have money that's been sitting in the general fund that has not been usable for any other purpose and it has not offset our mill rate. The money was returned to the, to, to the general fund. I could not spend it for the, no one could spend it for this project. So whether that money then was used to calculate a mill rate or used for another project, it would have to be authorized by the council and the RTM. Yeah. So it, it goes back into the, the main bank account. Okay. And then one year you had $96,000 appropriated, am I correct? Mm -hmm. And you didn't use any of that. Is correct. That, why was that? Uh, as this, this was before my time on the project. I know that some of this was the town's um, portion. There is a town portion of this, and there was a period of time where it was explained to me is that the, these were federal funds, transportation funds that were held up for several years from the feds down to the state. So this may have been one of the, those times where the town anted up its percentage, its, its portion of the, of, the, uh, of the construction project and the federal funds were not available. Okay. But that would, again, that's hearsay, that's, that's what, what was told to me. And in 2015 and 2016, there was uh, approximately 466 thousand dollars appropriated, but was that expended? Uh, the 15 and the 2018 money, that that was a that 15 was and a, 16. Yeah, that uh, that was appropriated. Most of that was expended, or that money has been encumbered to the engineering firm to finish the design and permitting. So it's not it's not available. It's encumbered. If this project was to be canceled, there would be I would have to can cancel the engineering contracts, and some of those that money that was set aside for the engineering contracts would come back to the town. It, with I'm, several of contracts. I'm concerned about appropriations that are made and effectively increase the mill rate to our taxpayers then aren't used for the purpose they were appropriated for and don't come back to offset future taxes by the taxpayers. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think that we all have to take that into co to, to consideration in our planning and to come up with a surfeit of $415,000 at this point is uh, concerns me that that's money that's come out of taxpayers' pro pro pockets and they haven't gotten anything that they paid for. Plus, plus, uh, it hasn't been returned. It's sitting there and it has been returned to them to offset their future tax bills. That $415,000 would be used as the town's match for the construction. On this project, the town had to pay for all the engineering and permitting and then the construction was an 80% federal money, 20% yeah. town money. So that's $415,000. Since there's no construction contract out there, I can't encumber that to, to a contractor because I have none, but that will be used for the construction. If the price of the estimate of the construction goes up, I will need more money than that. So, so that's the town's portion for the construction. Well, and the thing I'm driving at, at this is that we're, we have a practice of appropriating money and the money is not used for what it's appropriated for and then it just sits there have no benefit to the taxpayer and I think that we have to look at that to try to get control of that money so that we're not taxing the people for things that they don't get they don't get the, the service or the benefit or the property improvement that they're supposed to get out of that tax money and not only is it they're not getting it, but the surplus is not coming back to them. I think uh, the town manager wanted to uh, well, just jump to in. mention this is still yeah. an active project, so that would have been a council decision, nothing to do with staff decision. As long as it's active and you have to provide the match, you're going to encumber those dollars. 
So it's really, at, you know, what a council wants to do along the way. As long as they want this project, then you keep that money in there. And you, yeah. you need to. So until they cancel it or until you cancel it, that money stays. But the thing about it is this goes back now 20 years. Right. And again, council and decision. It's, yeah. and, and it's, I don't know that the council has ever considered it. But it also bothers me in that this is just one project of many that the town runs. And in this one project, we find $415,000 of money that was appropriated, not spent, and then just let to sit there while the taxpayers keep paying uh, a mill rate and keep paying taxes that for some of them is producing a, a, an appreciable hardship. Thank you, Councillor Zapari. We have other councillors that have questions, so Councillor Heed. What were, uh, sorry, uh, what were the uh, contaminations that you came across? Hydrocarbons, uh, which usually is just falling on asphalt, and there was it's hydrocarbons and <coughs> some lead. So we don't know what was there. What we, what the amounts, uh, the we don't have to clean it up if you don't touch it. Uh, so and if we do touch it, it's probably going to be trucked away in two 40 cubic yard, uh, 20 cubic yard dump trucks. Will have to go to probably a secured site. <coughs> it had to be identified because the contractor needs to know what's there. Uh, but it's it's something that we had to test for and we found. And the price just goes up uh, to haul the material away. We can't reuse it on site. Council Marossi? Yeah, Gary, doesn't the state have a project or a program for re? Uh, uh, rehabilitating the uh, bridges? Uh, this is a culvert, this, so it doesn't it's fall it's under the local bridge okay. fund. And there's questions whether any of the local bridge funding will be available in the next couple of years from, because of the issues with DOT funding. Uh, so, uh, but this is a culvert here, so this doesn't even match anything. It's not inspected by the state, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be available. Councilor Franco, did you have a question? Yes, so out of pocket for plan A, the original, for the town is 1.2 million. Is that what you're approximating? And, and what I'm approximating if it's, if the it's construction. It's gonna be a long drawn out process probably. Correct. Plan B is for about 450,000 and we can do it much quicker. We don't have to jump through all the hoops with the, all the That's permits correct. and all these other things. What do you think the safety is with just putting four feet on both sides. For people walking up and down, how do you think the safety will be? Well, uh, if, if I could ask Mark Berry, which is our Parks and Rec Director, not on safety, he's not our safety guy, <laughs> but some of the other plans that you have, or the town has for bike paths, bike lanes, maybe falls right into that question. So yeah. if, if, if I could sure. pass it on to my esteemed colleague. Sure. <laughs> it's twice I've heard that today. Um, <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that, one of the alternatives that Gary mentioned was going back to the state to see if we could reallocate that money um, to another project in town. And as it so happens, uh, VHB, who is a consultant who specializes in uh, bike trails, uh, did a study for the town. Uh, it was approved in a CIP in 2017 for development of a plan to go from Depot Road over to Thomas Road and um, so I've got some information that I'm just going to share with everyone. Um, so the first thing that, uh, that took place was um, they came out and they did a site visit. Let me just throw the map up. This is uh, Depot Road right here. Uh, Town Hall is, is right here. This is Route 1. It goes across uh, the Poquanic River. Um, you take a, a left onto South Road, follow South Road. It goes underneath the, uh, the railroad tracks, and it goes out to, uh, towards the airport, becomes Runway Lane. Uh, after it passes, at some point, it becomes Towers Ave and goes all the way out, and in this particular stretch right here is what we've been talking about, Thomas Road. I'll give you that back, thanks. So the, uh, 
the study included a site visit they met with the planning department a town engineer and parks and recreation they walked the entire site they from that they broke up and if you can see on that map it may be a little difficult to read they broke up the entire project into ten different segments based on you know particular attributes in a particular section of that of that area they also did a survey they reached out through Facebook postings on the planning department web page the parks and recreation web page to and they had they directed people to complete a survey to determine what type of bike facility people would prefer the most preferred type of facility was a shared use path the least preferred was a wide shoulder and I've got another slide to put up so these are the the different types of bike paths there's a shared lane bikeway and if you can see pretty much all there is is a kind of the universal bike symbol which is placed along the road and this is typically used in used on minor local street roads with with low speeds this is a paved shoulder which is you know your traditional you've just got this longitudinal line which runs along the the edge of the of the road this is a example of a bike lane here where you have the longitudinal line and you also have the bike symbols and it's to designate to folks that that's a bike and pedestrian way and then you also have the the shared use path which is typically offset from the road as you can see here it's probably 12 feet wide and is striped down the middle so that that gives people a sense of you know you stay on the right depending on which way you're traveling so those are the the different types of bike paths that they looked at. Once they had completed that, um, they started doing the engineering. Uh, they came up with three alternatives. They developed cost estimates. They completed a uh, impact analysis, and they also developed a scoring. Uh, matrix based on seven different or 17 different criteria so the 17 different criteria are listed right here and they um, scored them uh, four being the most preferred one being the least preferred and, and these are the they actually ended up with uh, with four different four different alternates uh, but they looked at things like relocation and right-of-way acquisition uh, pedestrian and bicycle con connections to public facilities noise impacts wetlands floodplain impacts bridge costs uh, construction impacts, uh, public utility impacts, and so they scored the, the four different proposals. Uh, and once that was complete, they did a survey, uh, oh, they, I'm sorry, they didn't do a survey, they did uh, public outreach, and um, I think we had probably close to 30 people that came, looked at the different alternatives uh, based on those. They came up with a uh, with a recommendation, and excuse me, I'm going to jump up one more time. So, based on those uh, the 17 different criteria the uh, alternative one scored the highest. Now, alternative one is a combination of uh, a 12 foot wide paved path 
depending on the, and these are the different sections of the entire project. Uh, a five foot bike lane, uh, a six foot wide bike lane. Uh, so these are all, well the bike lanes are shared space on the existing road. It would require remarking a portion of the road and to have a designated uh, bike lane. Uh, as probably most of you are well aware, the, the area under the, under the uh, train tracks is very restrictive. Um, that would just simply be marked um, with the, the bike symbol right in the middle of the road just so that people know that bikes pass through there. There's just no room to, to put any type of a bike path or do any other type of striping. Um, so these are all the different alternatives. So to get back to your question about safety, um, you know, the consultants looked at what space that they had to work with and what Gary is recommending is actually, uh, you can see, is on this, on this entire section. So it's, it's less than ideal, uh, but it, it is something that, uh, that does work. And we wouldn't have to worry about netting if we just widen the road, is that correct? Correct, there'd be no property takes. Uh, so we wouldn't have to worry about uh, paying, for the, paying for the easement and also the netting. Uh, the environmentals, I did, I did check with our, the town's environmental planner. Uh, Deb Jones has been here a long time and we are staying out of the, sens we are staying out of the sensitive areas. Uh, that, uh, you brought up a good point, on a constricted area we'd put the marking in the middle of the, the culvert crossing there to uh, uh, notify people or to warn people. And what we would have to do, the road is fairly straight now, we would need to meander the road a little bit to stay out of the sense of areas. It won't be a, a huge turn, the speed limits will still stay the same, but it won't have quite of a, a straight on look. Uh, but based on, on what we came up with, what we could have, and then how it fit into the, 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 the plan that uh, Mark's, uh, Mark's crew came up with, uh, it's, it, it, is, it is doable. Okay, one last question, one more. <laughs> Because um, my concern is about safety on the road, and I've heard a lot of people that was their biggest problem. And they said the road is very dark. Is there anything about putting in lights down that road at all in the future? There, we could add a few more street lights. There are, there are a few utility poles, but then they, they actually the power lines dive underground because of the, uh, because of the runway approaches. Uh, the, there may be some low type bollard type lighting I could put in on a, on a, on a lower, uh, we could look at that if, if that was a concern of the council. On, on parts of the safety, the path that we were putting in only had a five foot separation from the road mm -hmm. to the bike path itself. I mean, five, five feet is better than no feet, mm -hmm. but there, there wasn't a structure between the road itself and the bikeway, the bike path. So if a car was going off the road, there is, there is five feet of grass to react to and then you're on the, the asphalt path, so uh, there's no curbing, no nothing. So it is something that can be used. It's, it meets the standards. Okay. Uh, but the lighting, we, we can look at adding uh, additional lighting to the poles, and in those areas where it goes underground, I do believe we should be able to put something smaller in, a small 12-foot pole or something around that size just to provide some sort of lighting along that edge. Okay. Councilor Parker. Thank you. Okay. you um, suggested about going to talk to the COG about reallocating? Correct. If they say no, what's our option? Uh, if, if the COG and, and the COG go through the federal standards, then the money just doesn't get expended by the town. Uh, you know, it'll, we'll have to write letters uh, to get out of the agreements and that. Uh, so that's what it will take. Uh, the, with the engineering contracts we have, they're, they're written as such as that if the town terminates for good reason, I have to pay the engineer up to the point that they have done work, and the work that they've done, there's no termination fees. Uh, so uh, th that's, uh, that's, that's good. But the money that we're spending right now is really our own money, the town's money. The federal money doesn't kick in until the construction or the actual purchase of the easements. It, it doesn't kick in until after the, it's all done, correct? No. Once, was, once, once, we, once we start the work, there, then there is a, a, a cash flow coming in, but we have to, let the con we have to award the contracts, and, we're, and we're, we're months away from that. 80%? Is that what you said? 80% federal up to, well, I up think it's to. $1.4 million. So if the construction costs go higher than that, I would ask for more money, but in this day and age, I don't know what's out there. Okay. I don't know. 
the, the agreement was that was the federal's share. Councillor Atwood. Gary, you mentioned that possibly having to curb the road some because of uh, hazardous waste or whatever, uh, or avoiding areas. Wouldn't it make sense to actually curb the road even more because that would slow traffic? We, we could, the right of way isn't that large, so we, so we need to be, to be careful. So we could put a little bit more of a bend into it and with a double yellow down there, it does, it'll, it, it, won't, it won't look as straight. Uh, we could try to, I would just bend it or curve it as much as possible. Uh, still staying within standards and that because we don't want to violate any standards, but you know, that, that could be done. But the right of way isn't as wide as uh, we hoped it would have been. Um, do Councillor Schmidt or Councillor Obrey want to talk before we go second times? I just wondered, um, it says 450000 but are there additional costs that will be incurred <coughs> that uh, we would have to consider? Uh, any, not perhaps not engineering, but there might be other types of cost permitting and uh, the relocation of the rotten utilities. Perhaps that still doesn't have to be done. That's great. If we resurface the road, that's with our own crews. Uh, that's the estimate we have is bringing a contractor in to, to reclaim, recycle the road, and, and purchase the asphalt in it. Lighting would be extra. We, we'd have to take a look at, at what that would cost to install the light or to or put the underground wires in for the lighting. But the other cut, the permitting cost, I've, there is no permitting because I'm out of the wetlands. I'm not affecting any wetlands, tidal wetlands, or anything else. So we stay out of all that. And then my other thought was somebody had mentioned to me that when you put together these estimates, you do not figure in the cost of using the personnel in, the, uh, in your department. Correct. So that actually it, that should really be considered to show how much it costs in order to put or you know, do the whole thing. Uh, I, I would say yes if we were getting a grant from the state or the right. federal government because you want all the grant money coming back. Uh, right. if, if it's coming out of our own pocket, I'm going to say no. But my analysis last year to the previous council was, you know, why are we paving? I can pave between 15, excuse me, 17 and 300 percent less than the, than the low bid contractors that have bid to the state. Right. And that that's all in. That includes their benefits. That includes trucks that are already purchased, the capitalization. What that 17% on the low end is really is, is a profit of a private firm. And we only pave about 18 days out of the year. So, so we use our existing forces with the, with the equipment that we have, and instead of pay, you know, paying ourselves again, we're putting more money into asphalt, more money into product, more roads being resurfaced. So one analysis I do is that, is, is it the right thing to do with the forces we have? Is it cost effective? Yes, it is, because I am cheaper. On the other side, if we don't get grant dollars for it, we should use our, the money that we have there for more road, to resurface more road. We have Councilor Obrey wanted to say something, and then Zaperi, then Morovsic, then Grant Johnson. Okay. Um, God, I waited so long, I probably forgot the, <laughs> the question. Um, if we do this with, with the new plan you have, which I think is, is excellent, can we continue to pursue widening the bridge as another project problem? Uh, we, we can. We, we would, uh, if, if that's the council's wish, we'll take a look at it, what is required permitting-wise ourselves, because we would be permit, we'd be working with the state, not through the feds. So we, some of the issues still may be there. Part of it could be is that it, can we just, like I said before, cantilever a walk over it so we're not putting any foundations into any right, place. Right. We're not building this large fishing platform, which is part of the project. It's 16 feet wide. We're drilling piles in. It's, it, it won't be that. It'll be something just to get people safely across uh, right. in, in that section. So we can look at that, but that could be another project, absolutely. I would, I would hope that could happen. The other thing was, uh, do you have the ability now, as uh, other towns have, I don't think we have, is that uh, they rut the <coughs> tire so that if your tire goes over, you know, it makes a lot of noise? Uh, no, that there'd be a contractor, but I know there's contractors out there that do that. Uh, so uh, that, that's a good question, whether that rumble strip can be there along a bike lane. Uh, I'd have to look into it. I've, yeah, I'm sure that, it can. It's only about, you know, yay wide. 
But right. it really makes a difference because when you hit it with your tire, oh yeah, no, the, 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 it would seem to me it would almost be a safety factor. And it shouldn't be too much of a problem because we do not have any neighbors. Not many neighbors abutting so because people usually don't like to hear that rattle. But I, I, I can ask that question. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll, I'll find an answer out whether we can put that rumble strip in. Councilor Zaferi? Yeah, now, this, this project is being driven by the concept that there's, a, of there's high pedestrian and bicycle use at Thomas Road. Correct. Am I correct? Have we done any study to, to show just what, what the bicycle and pedestrian use of Thomas Road is? No. It's a presumption. I think an observation from the people, correct, it's an observation from the people who have used the road uh, and studied. I, I would use the road every day, and so does my wife, and we, we don't, and I used to bicycle that road every day, by the way, and I was the only bicyclist that I saw on it almost invariably, mm -hmm. and uh, I rarely see anybody walking, but, okay, so it, the other question I had for you, in this, it, not related, Per se, what would be the cost of simply resurfacing Thomas Road as it is now? We we just couldn't resurface it. Mean mean putting some resurfacing is putting just something on top of it because it's yeah. it's, it's cracked. The base is cracked. It's 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 horrible. Nothing would hold up. To resurface the road itself, not make it as wide. We're widening it about a third. 350,000, 375. So we're talking about the difference between just making the road serviceable and widening it is about $100,000. Probably something a little less than because we've got to grind and put the asphalt down, but we're not putting any base in. Um, I, I would it, to have a better number than just right off the top of my head. Uh, you know, we, we could calculate that number. Councilor Morosic? Yeah, it would be about 300,000 for that, for that road. Gary, how are you going to handle the, the uh, train tracks? You're going to cross the train track? No. No, no, we, no. no, no we, we don't go that far. We just go to the intersection of Shenacossa, Thomas Road, then we come down to Tower Avenue. We, we stop at Tower Avenue. We stop at the, there, there's no, the train tracks parallel it to the yeah. airport side, but we don't well, cross I thought you I thought you around the airport. No, no. no that, that, that was Mark Berry was saying is, is that if, okay. if that bike lanes was to go through right. oh, okay. I, South okay. Road, Thomas Road. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. okay. And then I had a, I had a question, this, and, and I'm not a construction engineer, um, but if, if you're doing one road and you're putting four foot on either side, what would prevent you from doing 11 foot, 11 foot, 8 feet, like making a wider path just on one side of it? Or is that not feasible with drainage and such? I, I don't think it's drainage uh, from a bikeway needs to be 10 feet for standard for two-way traffic. So we're looking at, you can have two-way traffic on two four-foot, okay. one eight-foot would be too tight to pass. Too tight and there's no separation then. So I think that's the problem because now you've got people going with traffic and then you have them going against traffic. Okay, I understand. On one side. Thank you, I didn't, under, I didn't realize that. Okay, are there any other, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, that's all right. I just want to mention, you know, I, I was on the RTM when this came up originally, and uh, Methuselah and me. But anyways, uh, at that time, there was a great deal of passion about it because of the fact that there had been somebody killed on the road. Correct. And I know that there's been several accidents over the years. And um, it's always been very disappointing to me that this has gone on and on and on and never got finished. So I'm very enthused in having this go forward. Uh, we're going to end up with a better road. We're going to end up with a place for people to walk, ride their bikes, because I see a lot of people walking on that road. I know there's a great deal of people that don't have vehicles that walk up and down that road. So personally, I'd be thrilled to see something finally happen. And as long as we're going to continue to look at the possibilities of something with the bridge, because I don't like the idea that it does come together like, down like that. That's Absolutely. probably going to create a bit of a problem. But as long as we go forward with looking towards widening the bridge also, or whatever you, you, you would think would be best, I think this is well overdue being done. Councilor Heath? 
I agree. I agree. It's well overdue to being done, and the, the alternative he's given, I think, makes sense given that you know we're in a constricted financial environment. Um, the first option is preferred, but you know it, you've laid out reasons why you know it's not really an option anymore. Um, but I think I can support the second option, the alternative. If there's no other discussion, are you looking for any kind of um, motion from us tonight, Mr. Burke? Would you like us to yeah. give you a favorable? Yeah. Favorable to the full council that we go with the alternative. Correct. Is there a motion to recommend um, the alternative to, for Mr. Burt to direct so moved. Director Schneider? I so moved by Zapari, seconded by Parker. <laughs> Thank you for not making me finish that sentence. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. So moved unanimously. Okay, so that takes us to 2017 Thank you, Mr. Barry. Introduction of Illicit Stormwater Discharge Ordinance. <coughs> oh, with me tonight is Chris Lund, who's, uh, who's working on this project. He uh, manages the wastewater treatment plant. Mr. Lund? Yeah, Mr. Hello. Thank you. And he does give tours down there, so if anyone would like to see how it works, please it's get a hold of him. It's been a while. I've been there, but I'll have to go back. So do you want to talk to us a little bit about it, or do you want to go straight to questions? What's your preference? Uh, just very quickly, uh, in your packet, you should have the referral memo and then the full draft of the ordinance, as well as a resolution for setting the public hearing, which we'd like you to address this evening. Um, the ordinance itself is based on uh, requirements that came out of the state of Connecticut with the update to their general permit for MS4s, municipal small separate sanitary or excuse me, stormwater systems. Um, that permit is now in effect and went into effect in 2017. According to the requirements within the permit, we are any community or any entity that is an MS4 permittee is required to have several different things in place at various times. The first one of note for us is to have the IDDE ordinance in place by July 1st of this year. So that's why we're here to uh, make sure we meet that time frame. Um, basically, what the ordinance really does is it provides guidance to the member or the people in the town because this is a town ordinance and it impacts just the town itself. Um, I do have some uh, paperwork um, just for your viewing pleasure to grab on the way out that just discusses a little bit more you know, informally what we have on our website for the citizens so they know what is an illicit discharge. You know, what, what should I be looking for? Should I report it? How to report it? So that information is here, just a very simplified version. Um, but what we're trying to do is to provide uh, some teeth to our ordinance, to the ability to you know, stop an illicit discharge when we see it, to direct people to stop discharging illegally. Um, we don't want people pouring, you know, a, a good example that I've seen in the past is somebody changes their oil in their car or in their driveway and they pour the oil into the catch basin. So simplified version. There's obviously many more things that could occur, but that's what we're really looking forward to is just stopping that before it happens, educating the public. Um, if there is an issue where someone doesn't want to respond to us, we have the ability to, if it's immediate or emergency, we can respond ourselves immediately, direct the contractor, recoup the cost later. Um, if it's something that may be a little less uh, noxious that we just want them to cease and desist, uh, we can give them warnings and provide some guidance and if they still continue to uh, um, violate the ordinance then there are the p potential to issue citations and fines. So really we're trying to make it as easy for us to um, enforce and easy as possible for the community out there to adhere to it. So um, that's a quick introduction. Is the, um, I noticed it says it establishes a stormwater compliance officer. Is that a title that will be bestowed on one of you? Um, I'm assuming we're not going to have a new hire, correct? Uh, we're going to let the town manager uh, appoint that individual. So, 
Will it be a paid position? We don't anticipate an additional position. An existing position, an existing employee would be designated as that person. Same pay? Okay. Same pay scale? Yeah. We would hope that it's not something that requires a full-time job, just the occasional so incident arises same, and you go out and deal with it. <laughs> so that's out of your department? It may be. Yeah. Representative, or Councilor Franco, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What about the citation hearing officer? Uh, that is another uh, individual that I think is an existing position that I would call a collateral duty that it's appointed for. So you're not going to have people lined up outside your door waiting to come in for hearings? Gosh, I hope it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I had a question. I had read that if somebody is um, repetitively doing this, you could turn off their use to this. I, what is it? Um, stormwater discharge, the sewer? Is that what it is? The sewer? So this is. Uh, um, because in my mind, it's just for it's definition it's purposes, so the, our town we have uh, sanitary sewer, which is wastewater sewer, mm -hmm. which is separate entirely from the storm drain system. Okay. So what we would, you know, in the case where let's say someone has connected um, a cellar drain or a business has a drain inside, let's say an auto shop has a drain, a floor drain that goes into the storm basin, we would if we learned of it, we'd approach them and ask them to disconnect it. Mm -hmm. um, and if they didn't comply, then we would have the ability to either issue a citation or if, for example, we're catching them actively dumping, we could take it upon ourselves, according to the ordinance, to disconnect it, and recoup and the costs, and then they would still have to obviously deal with their problems. So you just turn off their storm drain? Well, unfortunately, we don't have valves to do it, so it's dig it up and plug the line. But really? Okay. That is when I read it, I was just like, wow, how are they going to do that? Yeah, it's not, it's okay. not like the typical sanitary <laughs> sewer where everybody's connected. So. Okay. Council Morales. I've got a question. <clears throat> would you, uh, when would you get the police involved? I know there's a compliance, uh, you have a compliance officer, but sometimes you need to, you might have a problem there with the, the owner or the person that's uh, violating the ordinance. I think if it becomes something that is that significant, we would go to DEEP and the environmental police that they provide. Well, you go to DEP first? Yes. Yep. Okay. Councilor Zapari. You said you, you handle the storm drain water differently than the sewer water. That's correct. How, how do you handle the storm drain water? So storm drain, um, basically we have about 400 outfalls throughout the town. So if it runs in, off the street into a catch basin, um, sort of to use the finding door example, all drains go to the sea eventually. So they go through outfalls either directly into one of the uh, water bodies or okay. intermediately. And there's no processing of that? That's correct. That? There's no processing. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other first time questions before we go to second time? Go ahead. But Gary, is there a moratorium on the uh, storm drains to the uh, to the uh, sound? No. No. You, you can put another uh, culvert in? I do believe so with, with the permit. I, I have no, no, I have not heard of any more torrents. Because, no, we, we, would, we would talk, <clears throat> when I was working with the public works down in Grant Long Point, we were told no, no more uh, culverts. That's, uh, that was a moratorium that they gave us. I don't know if it's still. No, we haven't, uh, haven't tried to establish any more, so I haven't heard that. But. I'll have to look into it. Yeah, I guess. If there are no other questions, then I guess you will just take a favorable vote. All those in favor of um, having them proceed with the ordinance, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. So now we are on to the next item Do on we the have agenda. To set a, uh, yes. Uh, yes, no. that's a separate item. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the introduction of the illicit stormwater discharge ordinance. So now we're on 2017 0309 which is the resolution. So, Councillor Parker, please. Resolution setting a public hearing on illicit stormwater discharge ordinance. Resolved that the town council will hold a public hearing on an illicit stormwater discharge ordinance on Tuesday, March 6, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. in the town hall annex, community room one. I so move. Second. Thank you. 
Moved by Parker, seconded by Morovsic. This is just setting the time for the public hearing on the ordinance. If there's no discussion, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining, so moved unanimously. And that concludes our business with Mr. Schneider. Mr. Lund, thank you very much for waiting. So we're on to item seven on the agenda, consideration of committee referral items as per the town council referral list. And the first thing here are recommendations for deletion. And I know there were some concerns. Are there any items on the deletion list that any councilors would like to see maintained? Councilor Heed. Uh, I'd like to see maintained just for a little while longer, 2017-0090 combined planning and zoning commission. I think until they've actually been combined, we should leave it open. Okay. Do you have others? No. Uh, Councilor Franco? Um, sale and lease of town-owned excessive property. What number is that, please? I'm sorry, 2016-0184. Okay. Do you have others? That does, that is the building as well. Is that, what's that in regards to, or is that Mr. Birch, does that include buildings or does that it's just that empty land parcels? Just the parcels. Well, it includes buildings, yeah, and it's all together. Yeah. Okay. The schools and all that. All right, so then we want to leave that open. Which um, I think we have them all actively marketed right now. And did you have any others? The Public Safety Committee, 2016-0203. Which one? Zero Establishment of an ad hoc public safety committee 2016-0203. Third one down on the on page uh, page one. Mm -hmm. yes. Can I just to clarify that's a, that was a referral made by the last council for an ad hoc committee, not a permanent standing committee. Which will be part of the rules if they get yes. passed. You'll have part of the rules. Standing. So we don't need to say that one now? No, it's part of the rules. Yeah. Okay. So we, we don't have to include that one then if she wants to. Okay, great. And were there any others that you wanted? I was, I was just going to mention on the pension fund, the 136, the 0136. Um, that had been an ongoing item with the last council, and I actually got Tim Ryer. Uh, it's going to come probably sometime, and that's our consultant for retirement. Um, he's going to probably come in February to give an update on our retirement system, start talking about options for the future. So. We can leave it on or not, but either way, I'm bringing them here to discuss. That was going to be the one that I was going to ask to have open. So it's 2017-0136 pension fund. Anyone else have anything else they would like left open? Council Overy? Uh, yeah. Um, let's see, 0107 type town-wide dispatch discussion. I'd like to see that stay as an ongoing Anyone else? What if we don't know what some of these entail? Mm. Like, then we ask Mr. Burt. And if he doesn't know, yeah. then we ask <laughs> this person. <laughs> There's a couple odd ones on there. You got any particular you're interested in? About the um, employees' vacation sick day balances, was that a topic of discussion at some point? <coughs> yes, uh, in the policy. Do you, do you know, Nikki, the background on that? Yes, it was made um, after a particular, you know, employee payout for excess sick or vacation, um, never discussed, made and left on the referral list for a number of years. How about build a budget? What does that entail? Same thing. <laughs> Just things that were I think that was an idea uh, from a previous counselor, the idea of starting with revenues and working backwards to develop a budget. And the actual that. referral says to uh, adding a build a budget feature to the town's website to allow Groton residents and taxpayers an opportunity to play with different budget scenarios. And it's not very feasible. Okay. Had a board, board of Education City of Groton liaison. That, would be that, that sort of was my idea at one point to have liaisons that promotes one another. I think it was tried once or twice with the city. And I think it's been done. It's been done. It's still going on with the school. Mm -hmm. yeah. we so it's been over? accomplished with the school and well, not we, so much with the city. We have, don't we have the Board of Education town 
city committee that meets on a regular basis? Yes, but this isn't referring to that. This is just referring to actual liaisons. But I mean, if we have that, we don't really need this then, if we're meeting at, at another entity, so to speak. Part of it is to bring information to each group, though, and that didn't always happen with that group. Okay, so it's your preference. Do you, do you want to see that left open? If we have something else going on, I believe we can shut that one. Okay. <clears throat> Councilor Atwater, did you have something? I, I was just wondering with the question about the charter revision, um, should that be left on there just because it is an ongoing? I mean, maybe we don't have anything to do with that now. It's out of our hands, but I don't know. The council action is concluded on it. Right. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So then, um, given that those items are being left open, then is there a motion to um, recommend for deletion of the remaining items? To make a motion to delete the remaining items. Moved by Morosic, seconded by as a fair. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstaining? Um, other business? Just to mention, Nikki had passed out the calendars for you to mark up for budget meetings. So please take a look at that and get back to Nikki. Anything else? 10 o'clock. Motion to adjourn. Second. <clears throat> Moved by Heath, seconded by Parker. All those in favor say aye. Aye. aye.